No worries. I don't know. It uh, it just wasn't the little uh, you know request to join thing wasn't coming up. So we got it now. We're in business, bro. It is good to see your face, man. You too. How are you, buddy? Good. Can I see your view? Are you at your place? Yeah. Yeah. Here. Uh, hold on. Here's. I'm sitting by my garden right now. There's the garden. Wow, bro. There's the my view. My gosh. From my garden. There's my house. Oh my gosh! And um, That's yeah, beautiful. Those are the, the Blue Ridge Mountains right there. Me and uh, me and George. Here's George. Wow. Oh, say hey, bro. Me and George. He's eating rocks right oh now. Oh my gosh! Me and George are hanging out. Say hi. That to is everybody. hilarious. <laughs> this is Georgie. So beautiful. Yeah, man. It's Bro, good. how you guys been out there, man? What a place to be quarantined. So beautiful. Yeah, it could definitely be worse, for sure. We're grateful. Um, my kids are just running around and fishing in the pond, and climbing trees and stuff. It's a lot of fun. I've been working on the tractor today. We have a, we had a tree fall down a couple of days ago, and so I'm like, I'm chopping it up and fixing the fence and mowing lawns and everything. It's good. I'm having. That's fun. awesome, man. Yes, sir. That's awesome, man. And how's your how's your wife? How's your kids been? They're doing great. They're doing great. All three three little dudes are happy and healthy. Uh, our our youngest son is going to turn two um, on Monday, so we're going to have a little party for him on um, Saturday tomorrow, and um, getting ready for that. That's awesome. You know, my boy was just born. What? Uh, Tuesday. <laughs> Come on, with that. that's incredible. Yeah, man. Quick, man, quick labor. Um, he is the tiniest thing, man. He's like this big. Oh, man, he's so, so cute. Good. That's so awesome, man. Uh, how Everybody good, happy, healthy? He's good? Everybody's well. We were in and out of there in 24 hours, man. Oh, man, that's amazing. Yeah, that's man, it was amazing. great. My wife's a champ, man. Yeah, she in is. In and out. And then uh, we got home, and I jumped on a live with Michael Koulianos, so... Oh my we made goodness. it just in time. <laughs> but it's awesome. been good, man. I haven't I haven't put that kid down except for maybe I've done a couple lives. Other than that, man, I've I've tried to get as much time with them as possible. All my, all my kids who've been here in the house, it's been incredible. So good, man. What a special yeah. time. I mean, it's obviously it's not like um it's not good, right? But it's uh God is able to use it for our good and I'm thankful. Yeah. I'm really thankful. So true. Yeah. Well, how's it been, man? I, I know uh kind of how we've been doing these lives kind of what sparked this was really um us wanting to kind of bring in friendships that we had built over the years i'd built over the years and just kind of having conversations we'd maybe have on a phone but maybe doing it publicly and it's been really cool i had jake hamilton um a few days ago bro just we tino jake's message marriage and talked about um just talked about dating. I asked him, what would you, what would some qualifying things for a man to date a woman? It's just some, just gold and all these men. And so I'm, I'm honored to jump on with you um, and, and have this time. What would you say has been like the, because I know you were on the road, if people don't know from four today. Um, I don't know if you could pan your camera up just a little bit. I think oh, I'm just yeah. going to, oh, cool, cool. Um, you know, you were on the road for four today for how many years when you were in your band? Yeah, almost 10 about nine and a half Ten years yeah and you guys traveled like how like where, where would you guys travel like to? yeah we traveled everywhere man i mean we would be um we'd be on tour for you know six months out of the year um probably eight months when you count writing and recording albums and you know rehearsal time and all that uh st shooting music videos and all those things but we would play um you know hundreds of shows every year all over the world we do um, i mean we did a bunch of tours in europe Australia, Japan, um, wow. South America, Central America, all over the States. Um, and so we got to see the world uh, a whole lot of times and, and um, to preach the gospel, not only to, to see the world, but to preach the gospel in you know, bars and nightclubs and music venues uh, in places wow. where the gospel is, you know, not only never preached, but where, um, you know, where, where Jesus is, is sometimes even openly mocked. And so we had this amazing opportunity to be able to um, to preach the gospel where the gospel was not being preached and to see God move 
in uncommon, unexpected places. And were you married at that time when you guys were touring? Yeah, so uh, I got married um, after about a year, uh, about a year and a half maybe um, after I joined the band. And so, yeah, my wife came on the road with us for uh, two or three years until our oh, man. son Kai was born. And then uh, we started touring a lot less and, and I would fly home one at least one day a week in the middle of tours to go take her on a date and, um, you know, take Kai to the park. So, uh, yeah, it was, we just sort of accommodated, you know, did what we had to do. And there was definitely grace for it while we were doing it. Um, and it was, you know, it was a blast. We had a lot of fun. And uh, I think, you know, every day I'm still leaning on lessons that I learned during that season. Wow. You know, I think the, the most profound thing that I, one of the most profound memories I have of you was when I think I emailed you to come and speak for an event we did. And my phone rang and why that was so significant was you said something to me that I'll never forget. You said, I, I won't ever come speak for a place of someone I'm not willing to give my number to. And from the get go, you've always been a relational person. Even when I've been into events where you're speaking to thousands of people or whether it's a stadium events or a big arena event, every time I've come in the room and I've always felt love from you. Um, you've always made me feel like a person, not just, you know, someone with a call, a call in their life. And, how have you been able to maintain that with kind of like you've had, you've had both because there's like Christian famous and then there's like fame in the world and you've kind of had a little bit of both, man. I would say you've, you've experienced both of that. How have you been able to maintain the posture of humility and loving the person in front of you? Uh, you know, that's been, it's been a conscious decision. Um, honestly, man, you know, I, uh, as as my level of influence grew through the years, uh, it didn't. It never made me feel like um, awesome. <laughs> it, it made me feel afraid. Wow! You know, I, I felt like man, you know, I, I'm leading people, and I'm people are looking to me as a, a role model or a mentor or you know, a pastor or whatever. Um, and uh, and and you know, the thought that I somehow did something to deserve that is um, is a thought that has just been illegal for me to entertain from the wow. beginning. And, and so there's been just a great level of conviction, not, not because I'm, you know, really wise and godly, uh, but because I have lived my life. Like I remember when I was, you know, a liar and a manipulator. I remember when I was perverse and wicked and selfish and dishonest and um, and so for for me to ever put myself in a position to look down on anyone is uh, is pretty silly. Um, and so, man, you know, I uh, I think I've just always been aware that I have something to learn from every person I meet, and whether it's so you good. know whether it's you or whether it's you know the guy bagging my groceries at Walmart or whether it's the you know a homeless woman on the street. You know, I think that there's a unique perspective. Certainly there are unique experiences and insights that every person carries. And, and I think that, um, you know, it's important that we as believers, yeah, we have things to offer to the world, but also the people we run into, they have things to offer to us. And, yeah. um, and so I, I think, you know, we have to be, be conscious about maintaining a posture of honor and making sure that love isn't just, you know, what we take, it's also what we give. Man, that's so good, man. And you were primarily around for those 10 years in your band, it wasn't Christian venues. It wasn't just church services. You, I think you guys, did you guys do like work tour? Did you guys do, yeah. uh, what were some tours you guys did that, that maybe people would, would recognize? Yeah, we did warp tour, um, twice. Uh, that's, that's certainly probably the most recognizable, you know, tour name. That How we was did. that? It was awesome. It was great. I mean, what, what an opportunity to be the only five Christians in a, you know, <laughs> you know, space where there's 500,000 people throughout the summer, like, you know, 90 bands on this tour. None of them are, none of them are there for Jesus <laughs> at all. And, um, and then to show up and, and to be able to preach the gospel in that kind of context is, I mean, it was amazing. And every day we'd see God move in amazing ways, but you know, on, on the other, uh, on the other hand, it's also, um, it's a, like a war zone, you know, um, and as beautiful as the, the victories that we saw were, I mean, we saw a lot of ugly stuff too. We had to make sure that we stayed 
um, plugged in to, um, to the presence and the person and the word of God, because it's really, really easy to feel like, man, I'm just, I'm just overwhelmed. We're outnumbered. You know, there's nothing I can do or say to change this thing. It's easy to feel hopeless when you're yeah. surrounded by so much, um, hopelessness, but, uh, yeah. but, but, you know, it, it, every time, every time we did it or every time we did a tour like that, you know, it was a, an exercise in making sure that Jesus was my source and Jesus is my supply. And it's not church attendance because I couldn't attend church when we were on tour. It wasn't, you know, um, being applauded and admired for my declaration of the gospel because, you know, way more than I got applauded for it, I got booed and, you know, and threatened for it. And so, um, you know, it, it, it's, I think, critical that we learn to, uh, to let Jesus be our source and our supply wow. instead so of the good. approval or, or applause or admiration of the world. You know, what, you, what you've lived is so contrary to, I think, what most people are brought up. It's like you get saved and you're told, stay away from bars, stay away. And I understand you have a struggle in that area. It's probably not the best idea to go into a bar yeah. if you've struggled as an alcoholic. But, I mean, you literally defied that in its face to the fullest and said, I'm not just going to go, I'm going to go as a missionary um, to this field, which to me is, is, is genius. What was it like? What were some of the dark moments you remember of being in this place as, as a believer? I know you told me a specific story, which I, I might butcher, but where you preach and then the guy after you got up and pretty much said everything that guy said, could you, could you maybe recap that story? Cause yeah. I'll never forget that story, bro. Like, yeah, it's, man. It's, so we, you know, ultimately, like the reason that we went, and I feel like I should say this, I'll tell you the story, but I feel like I, I should say this as well. Um, you know, the reason that I, I went where I went and I did what I did um, is, is not because I'm some, you know, mega Christian, um, but because I, I am convinced that the gospel needs to be preached and, um, and that the gospel is powerful and it is effective to change lives and to save sinners. And, you know, that simple conviction is something that I've seen so much confusion about in the modern church. There's a lot of people that are critical or skeptical about, I mean, can the gospel alone really change some, somebody's life? Can a gospel, can the gospel alone really reach the world? And my message uh, to them is yes, it can. And in fact, anyone who tells you otherwise probably has never tried to preach it. Wow. Uh, you know, the people that I find who are most uh, critical and most skeptical of the sufficiency of the gospel or people that don't ever preach the gospel. If anyone tells you that you need a Bible, you know, a degree in theology or, you know, a mega ministry or more social media followers or a better worship band or a bigger building to be effective in the presentation of the gospel and the advancement of the kingdom, uh, you should, you should cut that person's opinion out of your life uh, altogether because okay. God loves to use um, you know, broken, incomplete, lacking kids. I mean, I didn't know anything except Jesus loves you and you should follow him. And so I, I preached that the first day I ever stepped on stage and, uh, and, and uh, multiple people got born again. And, uh, and then I preached it the next day and multiple people got born again, again. And I, I thought, what in the world? I'm not nearly qualified enough for this. And, and my, the sense of my own lack of qualification has only grown through the years. The only reason that any life has been touched by because of what I've done is because I have built everything that I do around the simple gospel. Um, so I, I feel like I should say that. However, um, so to, to recap this story, we were on a tour with a band who um, shall remain nameless. Uh, and and they, <laughs> they were all guys that were once Christians and had abandoned the faith. And so they thought they were too smart and too cool and too charismatic for Jesus. And, um, and so they, when they got around me, they, you know, they hated everything that I stood for and, and everything that I said. And so every night I would go up on stage and I would preach the gospel. And then whatever I would say right after us, this band would get up on stage and their singer would say the opposite of that. And so if I would say, you know, listen, the, the world is a broken place. Um, you know, there's depravity and hardship, uh, around every corner, but there's hope in Jesus. He would get up and say, the world is a beautiful place. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Um, you wow. Know, if I would say that, you know, all of us are hopeless without Jesus, he would say, you don't need, you know, faith or religion or church as a crutch. You're powerful on your own. And so I felt like this wow. guy is coming along and like snatching up these seeds, you know, <laughs> I'm trying to preach to these kids and he's trying, he's unactively 
trying to undo everything that I did. And there was a time I was venting to my wife. And, and as I'm venting to her, that guy sort of walked by. We were sitting in our tour van and he walked by the van. And I thought, I'm going to go talk to him. Like, why are you doing this? You know, these kids, eternity is, is on the line here. And you're actively opposing God. Like you're crossing the line. Don't do that. Like I was going to check him. And, uh, and so I reach for the door and my wife goes, wait, wait, wait. She's wise, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and she said, I, I just, I think you need to, to pray first. Um, you know, before you jump out in your emotions and go talk. The to last somebody. thing you want to hear from your wife. <laughs> right, right. And so I'm like, fine. And so I just go for a walk. And, um, uh, and I think, Lord, you know, I'm, I'm angry. Right. And I, my, it, my anger is righteous anger because he's opposing your gospel and I'm telling God why I'm right. And he inter, uh, he, he interjects into my, uh, um, into my monologue. And he says, Maddie, I don't need you to defend me. Wow. And, uh, and I thought, well, okay, listen, I, I get it. Right. I, I, I know you don't need me. I mean, theologically, I, or philosophically, I understand you're God and I'm not, you don't need me to defend you, but you know, I'm, I'm righteously angry. And God said, well, you're angry, but I don't think it's righteous. Wow. And, uh, and man, I, you know, I realized in the moment I, I had to, to come to terms with why was I angry? I had to ask myself, I had to ask the Lord, what is it that's making me so angry? And I realized, man, that my anger was not, it was not because this guy was somehow undoing God's work uh, in, in the lives of these kids. He's not that powerful. My anger is because for the first time ever, I was being criticized and insulted for preaching the gospel instead of thanked and applauded. I realized that this guy wasn't, he wasn't um, diminishing God's glory. He was, he was diminishing mine. Wow. And, uh, and I realized, man, that for years of my life in, in ministry, I had preached the gospel for the glory it would bring me. And, um, Wow. And so I, you know, for the next several weeks, man, I just laid in the presence of God and said, Lord, just burn that thing out of me. Like if, if people drag me out of, of the building and, and, you know, beat me to death with stones, I, I want to praise you just the same as I would if everyone in the room falls on their face and repents and, and comes to, to saving faith. You know, I, I don't want my faithfulness to be um, built on, um, or, or predicated on the, the success, you know, the perceived success of my ministry. I want my faithfulness to be built on God's word. I, I want my yes to be to what God says to do, regardless of the consequences, whether good or bad or beneficial or harmful for me. And, uh, and so, you know, that, that moment, yeah, it was, it was a hard tour, you know, and we definitely faced some opposition, but uh, we saw, I, I saw, you know, significant growth in my life. Uh, I think in a, what is a pretty meaningful way to be able to divorce myself from the idea that the primary evidence that God has blessed what I'm doing is that lots of people like it. Um, because that's, wow. I mean, that's probably the, the, the primary deception in church leaders of our generation, Brian, is, is that, um, you know, if our parents believe the prosperity gospel, then, then our generation believes the popularity gospel. Wow. You know, we think that if, if God has blessed our ministry, then it, it means that lots of people like what we're doing. But if that's the case, then, I mean, you know, when Jesus was on trial and there was nobody there to defend him, when Jesus was on the cross and anyone who cared about him, which probably at that point was only 10 or 15 people, were standing <laughs> far off because they were scared to be close to him he would have been considered an absolute failure when he said, eat my f flesh and drink my blood and everyone but 12 left him. Yeah. I mean, he'd healed the sick. He'd raised the dead. He'd cast out demons at this point and people abandoned him. He would have been considered a failure in ministry. Jeremiah was wow. a living prophet preached for 40 years and nobody got saved. You know, Noah preached for uh, what over 75 years and only 11 people counting him were saved. And so like, you know, I, I say all of that because, um, the, the, the people that we admire and that we hold up as the standards and the models for ministry, a lot of them weren't popular. Um, and, and the success for them wasn't built on the fame that they accrued because of their, their ministry, their, yes to Jesus. their success for them was to, to, to live and die believing God's promises to them. So good.
how deadly is the fear of man to a believer? Because okay. and it's not just fear of like even fear of a godly man. Like how how dangerous is that for someone who's watching to really, you know, to really let people's applauds dictate what they say and what they preach and how they live. Yeah, well, you know, I think um, I, this is probably a disclaimer. I would say before I get into this, like I think you know, certainly God puts people in our life whose, you know, approval or disapproval can be godly confirmation for us. Um, you know, I have a spiritual father back home in Alabama. I have a wife, yeah. um, you know, there's counselors in my, in my life who I know are put there by God for my protection. And so I, I honor them if they say, Hey man, this idea that you have is, is not right or this thing you're doing is, is bad. I'll, you know, I'll honor them. But, uh, you know, but the fear of man in, in, in general, the idea that, um, you know, I should act or not act in, in such a way that uh, the people around me will feel, you know, happy or comfortable. They'll like me to make uh, likability. My goal in ministry is to completely, remove God's word is the central motivating factor for me. Wow. Um, and so, man, you know, I, it, it is, when I say it's, it's devastating, I mean, it's completely, if we as a body cannot divorce ourselves from the fear of man, we will never become who we were intended to be. We need preachers that'll still preach hell. We need preachers that'll still preach repentance. We need preachers that'll still preach uh, righteous living. You know, we need people that are willing to preach, you know, uncomfortable, difficult, hard to swallow. We need preachers that will still preach submission to godly authority. We need people that will preach the hard stuff uh, because and, and and we will lay that all on the altar if we don't if we don't divorce ourselves from the fear of man. We have to rise above that man and get lost in reverence for God's word and his presence at work in our life. Wow. What Man, you mentioned a few things. And what I've always loved about you, man, um, I feel like these lives are always a confession of what I've admired about the different people I had on for a while. I've always admired the fact that what is old school to some is actual real revelation for you. Because it's one I hear people talk about honor in theory. I hear people talk about submission to authority in theory, where it's a great idea until that authority says something they don't like. Then all of a sudden... <laughs> It excuses their transition. You know, yeah. like, bro, like, yeah. I, I work with uh, primarily millennials. You know, I work with, I'm, I'm a millennial, man. I'm, I'm 29 years old. And I understand that, you know, I, especially with me, I grew up, you know, well, I had a dad, but I was with my grandma most of the time. And my early years of my faith, to be honest, most of the problems that I encountered wasn't my pastors. I, I, I still, to this day, will teach things that the, the pastors I had when I got saved, those are great men. A great men of God. I was the knucklehead who just was rebellious and just couldn't get it. But I, in in that present moment, I was. It was always their fault, you know. Totally right. What do you, you know when it comes to like honor and submission? I feel like this is something that's so skewed because you have people that have messed it up. It's like Michael Culliano yesterday. He said, "Man, there's people that have messed up the presentation of the Holy Spirit, which is why you automatically, you know, yeah. opt them out of your relationship with God when it's impossible." But what about honor and submission. I've always known that to be a core value that you've carried. Yeah. And it's why I think when you get on a stage, man, you have a certain authority that is just not common, I think. And it stems from that. What is a godly way to view honor submission? How important is it to have people in your life to tell you no? Oh, it's, I mean, it's, it's critically, I mean, it's as important for me to, to be able to be told no in ministry uh, as it is for my kids to be told no when they're about to run into the street. Um, wow. I, I have seen guys, you know, so blow ministry that they, you know, end up getting a divorce from their wife and, and they end up in jail. Um, but it didn't just happen overnight. It happens um, because when godly people in your life come and say, listen, you have started down a path that I know leads to destruction. You know, we say things like God, God told me. And, you know, if you haven't heard it, then that's not my problem, but I know what God said to me. Or, or we say things yeah. like, you know, I have to do what I believe is best and what's, what's right for me. And, you know, nobody knows what's right for me and I got to do God's word. And, and man, you know, it is, it's, it's rooted in arrogance 
and that arrogance will breed isolation every time. Um, you know, here's, here's the truth, man. Like, uh, David, I think probably the best example is, is David in the Bible. Um, he was a, su the, the subject of a King named Saul and, um, the prophet shows up to David's house and, uh, anoints him to be the next King of Israel. Everybody knows David's going to be King of Israel. And, uh, and then Saul starts to go crazy and he starts to throw spears at David. And then he gets it in his head that he's going to murder David. And so David has to like run away and he's hiding in caves, running through the wilderness. Saul has literally lost his mind. He's literally possessed by a demon. He's trying to murder David and everybody knows that David's going to be the next King. And then David, you know, cuts a corner off of his, sneaks up behind Saul one day, cuts a corner off of his garment just to show Saul, I could have killed you and I spared you. And then he tears his clothes and he falls on the ground and he begins to weep and repent and say, who am I to lift a hand against the Lord's anointed? It, God put him in the position. And if I disagree with what he's doing with the position, it does not change the fact that God put him in the position. And, um, and so for me, man, there have certainly, there have been times uh, that, that, you know, my spiritual leadership has said things that I've disagreed with. But John Bevere teaches, and I think this is a critical teaching. He, he teaches yeah. that um, often uh, in, um, in the modern church, we'll say, well, you know, I'll, I'll submit to this person's leadership as long as I agree with the direction that we're going. But if, if they do something I disagree with or that I'm fundamentally opposed to, well, you know, I, I just can't follow them there. And John Bevere says, well, you're actually not submitted at all until there is a disagreement. It is only at the point at which you disagree with your spiritual authority that you finally have your first chance to submit to them, to say, well, I see it this way and you see it that way. And I'm going to choose to say, not my will, but yours be done. I trust that God put you in my life to protect me and to position me for whatever it is that the Lord has me uh, for me. And ultimately, man, and, and I could, get into this and this we could spend hours on this but ultimately i believe that had david not submitted to and continued to honor saul in spite of saul's um sort of uh uh, uh descent into madness uh, i believe that david would not have been the man that he needed to be to be the great king of israel that he was i believe that actually by honoring a dishonorable king like Saul, David developed what he needed by way of character to be able to lead Israel right. And, um, and so, you know, I would say to people, when you have, if, you, if Yahweh has called you to submit to the spiritual leadership of a person, and that person says or does something that you disagree with, believe this, God will honor your honor. God will honor wow. your honor. And if he has to move Saul out of the way, to position you for the place that you've been called to. He can do that. He's God. Um, but but wow. in the meantime, when you disagree, when you feel like they're not taking everything into consideration, when you're not sure that they're really hearing the voice of God, when you question their motives, when you question their perspective, when you're not entirely sure if they have your best interest in mind, in those times, that is your opportunity to die uh, and, to, and to say, God, I trust you. It's not that I trust this person. It's that I trust you, and I know that you have joined me in covenant relationship to this person. So until you remove them, God, I'm going to honor them, and I believe that you will honor my honor. I've seen that in so my life. I've seen that in the life of many other people, and it's a critical and, and tragically underexplained uh, kingdom principle. Yeah, I think the biggest, you know, we live in a, in a culture today that is fueled off of just what people feel. Yeah. And I think what's so dangerous with, I, 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 I remember this was months back when I was preaching because we do a Monday morning service and I was preaching. And I remember when I was preaching, I was literally thinking mm -hmm. to myself, like, Jesus is going to require me to live everything I'm saying. And I yeah. feel like in those moments, all those songs we sing, all those scriptures we read, all those times you say, come on and amen. There has to come a day where those things are, it's required of us now to honor what we've said. Yeah. Like, Lord, you know, like, um, you know, Lord, I give you my all. Like, you know, those, these songs, um, I don't know, you, you know what I'm talking about? There's these songs yeah. that we sing that are so deep. My wife is literally, you know, Maverick City Music, Refiner's Fire. She's like, don't sing that song, jokingly. 
Like yeah. you're asking the refiner to refine you. And I feel like we forget that he uses actual people to refine us in our lives. You know, how important is it just randomly? How important is it for community? Is community, is that something that you found value in as a believer? Yeah, absolutely, man. You know, I, I, I call it like the, the fire of fellowship, that God's desire is, is to burn away every impure or selfish or arrogant thing in you in the fire of fellowship. And, um, you know, like, here's the thing. I, I actually said to the, the people at our church several weeks ago, I said, listen, if, if you are in community with people and those people offend you or wound you or hurt you or insult you, you should know this. That's the point. The, <laughs> the whole point of God wow. calling us into relationship with each other is so that we can learn to love imperfect people. Isn't that the character of Christ? Dang. Everything God calls us to is for the purpose of, of, uh, of, of cultivating in us the character of Jesus. And so when, um, you know, when the imperfection or the humanity of the people around us gets put on display and somebody, you know, gossips about us, they, you know, stab us in the back. When somebody fails to consider our well-being and they make a decision that hurts us, you know, they speak thoughtlessly and they, they make a comment that, you know, diminishes or insults or offends us. That's actually the point. That's why God put you in church. That's why God put you in church with this person is so that you can learn to uh, yield to and manifest the character of Christ. And, uh, and if you were only ever around amazing, perfect, encouraging, inspirational people, you'd never have the opportunity to show grace. You'd never have the opportunity to display forgiveness. You'd never have the opportunity to, to walk in mercy. And what a tragedy that would be if the world never got to see grace, forgiveness, or mercy from the church. And so, um, you know, I would say to anybody watching this, anybody listening to this now or in the future, you know, if you are offended by people that are in community with you, you should know that's the point. And and why that, God put you in community with them. And it makes sense of that scripture that the world will know you're my disciples by the way you love one another. Yeah. And I think Jesus made that a point. He didn't say the world's going to know you're my disciples when you love the lost. Because exactly I think loving right. lost people, man, for me, that's so much easier. I go pray for them. I don't ever see them again. Yeah. But loving the same people continually, continually. You know, my kids now are getting older. My daughter's four. And it, Literally, the same thing I tell them every night, eat over your bowl, eat over your bowl. Yeah. I literally, there's sometimes I'm like, man, am I a broken record? Eat right. over your bowl. Do you want me to paint it for you? Do you want me to <laughs> tattoo it on my body? Eat over your bowl. You just got to take the bowl right to their chest. I exactly. Like, yeah, I literally am looking on Amazon. Is there some sort of bowls that strap on here? Like, <laughs> but, it, but it makes sense when you think of community. Like, those are the things. Like, I'm getting refined even being in my home by my own my own small family yeah. yet alone our community and i can honestly say the people that i've i've ran with for years that we've had those moments man we that we're, we're not where we're at because it's been peaches and cream man right. we've had head budding moments there's been times we've questioned well i want to run with you anymore you know like yeah but when we can when we can move past that that's dude that's so powerful that's the kingdom right there yes that is so powerful man yeah, man. You know, that's actually how um, uh, that's how uh, you you polish stones is you take a bunch of rough stones and you put them in what's called a tumbler. It's like a tube that spins and they and they all roll around and they bang into each other. And uh, and and it's that proximity um, that causes, you know, the rough edges on one stone to to wear down the rough edges on another. And, um, and, and then the other, you know, another stone will return the favor. And, and what happens is that, that you put these things in a tumbler and, and over time, uh, all of the rough edges begin to disappear uh, until you're able to, until the stones can, can ultimately get so shiny, you can pull them out and see your own face in them. And that's what Yahweh is doing to his church is he's put us in a tumbler. And he said, I, I'm calling you here's dude. You know, the real secret, man, is I, I don't I believe that more fruit is produced in my life by faithful uh, devotion to relationships than it is by actually the quality of the people I'm in relationship with. Like, wow, I, I became grew more by submitting to my spiritual father than I did by listening to him preach. Uh, and that's not in any way to take away from his preaching. 
Uh, I have grown more by, uh, by loving my wife faithfully through the years than I, than I have by listening to her talk about what she learned from the Bible. Um, I love to hear her talk about her revelation, but it is, it's actually by doing the things that the Bible teaches. You know, you don't, it's been said, you don't uh, learn theology, you do theology. Um, you know, what you believe about God, it has to transform you necessarily, or you don't really believe it. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, um, I, I actually believe that it's the act of submitting to authority that causes you to grow way more than it is the quality of the person you're submitted to. And so, you know, these people that think I got to get, you know, I got to go find Todd White or Michael Koulianos or Brian Barcelona, you know, I got to get some amazing man of God to like, bless me. I want them to be my spiritual father. They need to lay hands on me. You know, Bill Johnson, he's so anointed, you know, I want to be under his leadership. Like that's fine. But, but actually what would produce more fruit in you is to find someone who's accessible enough to put you in their car and drive to a restaurant with you and sit down and talk about life. Somebody you can go to their house and do yard work with them. It's those sorts of moments that will produce more in you than just going to someone's church and listening to them preach. It's true. Cause these guys, I feel like the big, you know, you know the same guys I do, man. I'm friends with Todd. I'm friends with Michael, Nick Wojcik, man, Lou Engel. I don't have close proximity to do life with these guys. Right. I mean, they're not checking in on me every day. I'm not, you know what I mean? There's not, to be honest with you, most of the time I just run into these guys in stadium events and it's high by, I mean, we love each other, right. but it's not, it's, we don't have real community like that. Yeah. And I, I, I feel like that's been the excuse of so many young people. When I say young people, I'm 20, 30, 40. Like, that's been the excuse is, oh, man, this community's flawed. Let me find the next community. Right. And let me find the next community. Well, maybe if I go here and I just feel like, man, like, yeah. maybe I'm just You'll old school. And, and, yeah, you, maybe I'm just yeah. old school and thinking, like, I, I feel like, you know, I need to be somewhere long enough to, for people to really get to know me. You know, I used to have this three-month rule back when I was in high school. Like, I never was someone's friend more than three months. Because after three months, you really start getting to know Brian. And I'm, I am was jacked in high school. Hmm. And so, like, man, I can't let no one get close. And I feel like I have found beauty. Some of the most rich relationships are people that have seen me in highs on stadiums. Hmm. And they've seen me in lows when I'm frustrated, like, in traffic in L.A. or for whatever reason. Like, right. So, man, that's so good what you're saying, man. Yeah, man. And that's, like, you know, I, I, you and I, we've been in some of the same – stadium event green rooms you know where you you know that you know that sense of like someone's talking to me but they're always kind of looking over my shoulder to see if maybe like somebody with a bigger name is gonna walk in the room behind me bro yeah. that's the truth <laughs> <laughs> they're like so good to see you matt he's so cool and then you know whoever walks heidi baker walks in they're like oh catch you later yeah. um you know trying to rub the right shoulder and shake the right hand and it's just gross man or, and, or um, the famous like hey man let's connect I'm kind of like, what does that even, I understand. And I, and I appreciate people that actually follow through with totally with real connection. But I feel like that's been such a cliche thing as well within our circles. Connecting yeah. really means today, what can I get from you? What could you get yeah. from me? Right. And it's very transactional, not covenantal. Yeah. And I, and I yeah. again, I, I feel like with you, you, you know, I've called you before. I remember I called you just processing stuff and going, Jake's another guy, man. I remember when I was just, Kind of going through it in my marriage, I called Jake. Jake came to my garage at my house wow. and sat down with my wife and counseled us. And wow. so when I have like there's these friendships where I may not see you know you guys every day, I feel like it's what you're saying, man. It's it's I don't know. It's it's that authentic relationship that go beyond just just stages, man. That's exactly right. That's actually why we moved out here to Tennessee. You know, like I was just hopping from green room to green room and stadium to stadium and big event to big event. And I just, it's, that's not where life is, man. Like that's not the kingdom. That may be the door, you know, the stadium altar call may be the door that someone comes through into the kingdom. But the reality of the kingdom is, you know, I, I'm out here with actually one of the young guys from my church just today. We were like mowing grass together and, and talking about the Lord and how he speaks to us through mountains. And, um, you know, and, and those are the kind of, of opportunities and relationships that you don't get when you're in a different city every weekend. Uh, and so for me to be able to just say, you know, I, I can't minister to everybody. I can't make disciples of everybody. I can't, um, you know, get my hands 
into the the mess of everybody's life. And so I'm just going to put down roots right here in the mountains of East Tennessee. And I'm going to pour my life out for whoever uh, makes their way here uh, has been so glorious, man. And to see, you know, yeah, it's, I'm ministering to way fewer people this year than I have in over a decade, but for me to be able to, to be the one that somebody calls when they say, you know, my, my child just told me that, that he's thinking about killing himself. Like, Maddie, I just need some help. Can I bring him over to your house? You know, when somebody calls and they say, Hey, like, I don't, I don't know if my marriage is going to make it and I just need some, some help or, you know, whatever, man, you know, I just need a shoulder to cry on. I'm, I'm afraid of what's going on. I just lost my job, you know, to be the one that is able to, to, to be the voice of strength and security, um, to, to call people back to faith in real life moments, um, has been just glorious, man. And, and I think this is really what the kingdom looks like is, uh, is family. Um, and I'll trade, you know, the spectacle for, for covenant relationships any day. That's so good. That's so good, man. I wanted to ask you, I know, for, you know, for the sake of time, um, did you grow up in church? Did you grow up a Bible fearing, Bible believing <laughs> man? I just found out yesterday, Michael Culliano's Greek or Orthodox, he was an altar boy. Yeah, you know the, these things. I, I, I did you grow up as an altar boy? I was a great like... Orthodox altar boy. Me and Michael. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I uh, no. So I I grew up in church, memorizing Bible verses because I loved the stories, and they would give me Jolly Ranchers if I did it. <laughs> I would, you remember being in school? I would do anything for a Jolly Rancher. Like, yeah, you could. You it would be like the Hunger Games if they were like <laughs> last kid standing gets this bowl of Jolly Ranchers. That is hilarious. So, but, uh, but man, I, um, yeah, I grew up in church and, and we didn't go to church because we had, you know, really a, like a living, vibrant relationship with God. Um, you know, God's voice wasn't something that we talked about or, um, even considered in my family. Uh, you know, it, it, I didn't go to any type of spirit filled church or anything like that. But yeah, I, I did. I grew up going to church and, and, you know, doing Awana and memorizing, Bible verses and, and, you know, all those sorts of things. Were you assemblies of God? No. Oh. No. no we, I, I got told that uh, speaking in tongues was demonic. And so, oh, man. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I was not assemblies of God at all. But we, um, I learned Bible stories. And I learned that if you say cuss words or have sex, you'll go to hell. And so, and so um, yeah, honestly, man, like, here's what I did. What I learned was that, um God speaks through the Bible, which is true and is, is life giving. And I learned that, um, uh, that, that righteousness matters, which is true and is life giving. And so, you know, I'm thankful for the foundation that I had because I think it's, it's one that I still, you know, I'm able to lean on today. Sure. There were, there were other things I wish I would have learned, but the stuff that I, they did get right, they totally got right. And I'm grateful for it. So good. And what was your, what was your big moment, man, that shifted everything from it just being like, man, scripture, Jolly Ranchers to like who you are, man? Because, again, when you communicate, you communicate from conviction. You can tell that you really believe what you say. What was that shift to say, man, I believe this gospel? Yeah, man. I um, well, well, first, the shift happened to where I said, I don't think I believe this at all. All I've ever seen is hypocrisy. You know, closed mindedness, um, this sort of escapist mentality, right? We'll build a church so that we can only hang out with like minded people and we'll send all of our kids to Christian school and um, and we'll just let the world go to hell and we'll wait for our wow. uh, the first flight out of here. And um, and I, I just thought, you know, I got to be 16, 17 years old and I thought, I don't want anything to do with this. And so for the most part, I stopped going to church and yeah, I wanted to live a moral life, but. Yeah, I also wanted to do drugs and sleep around and that sort of thing. So I, I like, you know, I went to college and I got into college and started studying philosophy and world religions. And, and I was just looking for truth. And I, I would have told you that I'm looking for what's true. And there's a, a, a great philosopher named Immanuel Kant who says for something to be true, it must be true for every man and every world at every time. And, uh, and so I wow. thought, OK, OK, I want to find what's true. 
that's that's not just biblical, right? Like I, I don't want to just take the Bible as the book because there's lots of other books. Like what does every human heart from every age uh, in, in, in every culture uh, agree on? And so what, what happened is, is in the summer after my freshman year of college, uh, I stayed on campus and I was working in the, uh, the admissions office. And, and during the summer, I'm, I'm reading about Buddhism. I'm reading about Taoism. I'm reading about Islam, studying transcendental meditation. I'm studying, you know, all sorts of worldviews and, and cultures. And, uh, and I'm finding that regarding morality or how we should live, that most philosophical religious leaders agreed that they, they all said we should be generous and patient and humble, kind and loving. Uh, but, but the more I realized that there was this sort of universal moral law, uh, the, the more terrifying this one thought became, I have failed to honor that law. Everyone agrees. Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, Lao Tzu, Plato, they all agreed that we should live a certain way, and I have failed miserably to live that way. I'm in big trouble. If, if every great thinker or spiritual voice from all human history says you should be kind and generous and humble and loving, and I have not been those things, what hope is there for me? If that's what God, whoever or whatever God is, if that's what God is, wants for me, I'm doomed. And, um, and so, you know, long, long story short, I end up, you know, I'm, I'm not going to church. I don't have any real Christian friends. I went to a Catholic university, so there was a lot of pseudo-spiritual tradition. But, um, you know, I'm sitting on uh, the steps of my dorm one night, and I'm reading this book about Buddha, about the life of Buddha. And, um, and suddenly, man, I, I, I wish I could just explain it. Suddenly it was like the doors of heaven opened and like the presence of the living God poured out on me like a dump truck full of water. I dropped this book and I sat on the steps sobbing, saying, God, I'm a sinner. I'm so far away from, from the life you have called me to live. The wow. only hope I will ever have is for you to give me mercy. And, um, and man, I, I, you know, the, it's hard for me to explain how it was both somehow the most peaceful I'd ever been and also the most terrified I'd ever been. I, I once wrote about this moment that it felt like waking up in a room full of strangers. You know, it, it was it was terrifying. I felt overwhelmingly exposed and vulnerable. Like I, um, everything, every thought and every motive I'd ever had was exposed, laid bare before God and before the host of heaven. And, um, and so I, I began to say, like, God, I, I, I am not anything. I have nothing to give. And, and, um, wow. and I, I don't have, uh, you know, the ability to speak well. And I'm not the smartest and I'm not the strongest and I'm not the most influential or charismatic. But everything I have, I want to give to you. And I just need to know who you are. And because I want to be with you and whatever you're doing. So I, I actually, that, that next day, I quit my job. And, um, and I, I left, gave, gave everything that I owned to a friend of mine, and I left my, my job, my campus, and I spent the next month, uh, four or five weeks, hitchhiking around the country and sleeping on park benches and relying on strangers and just trying to find the voice of God. Wow. To, like, tune in to the voice of God just so that I could get familiar with what he sounded like. And, um, and so I came back. I came back from that, that month hitchhiking around the country, and I'd love to say – you know, I started preaching the gospel on my campus and everybody got saved and it was awesome. But I didn't I didn't know the first thing about what it meant to be a man of God. But I, I came back and I actually tried to to go back to the way I was living before. Um, and I, you know, was going to parties and drinking and sleeping around. And, and what happened is, is that it felt like sin just didn't fit anymore. Like the things that the sin I used to be proud of, I was now ashamed of. And so um, I, it's like a, a shirt that sh shrunk in the wash, you know, like it, it just didn't fit me anymore. Um, and so slowly but surely, I began to just come to terms with the fact that, you know, this lifestyle is disgusting. This lifestyle is repulsive. I don't I don't want this anymore. And so, you know, I think that is the moment that I was really marked by grace where God said, 
you know, you're not an outsider um, debating or considering what I might be like. You are mine. And, and from here on out, you're going to live life uh, in my presence. My word is going to be the banner over you. And, um, and it doesn't mean that everything was perfect and that I lived sinlessly after that. But it meant that sin could never satisfy me. My appetite for the satisfaction or the gratification of flesh just couldn't, couldn't fill me anymore. And, um, yeah, you know, the rest is history. It's been a process of, of, of learning where real satisfaction is ever since then. Wow. Matty, thank you so much, man, for, for hopping on with me, man, today. Seriously, oh, dude. I can't, I can't wait to go and visit your guys' spot. I know you were telling me about it. I think oh, yeah, you guys yeah. were getting ready to transition there. Yes. It's so, awesome. Man, well, thank you so much. Would you mind just the next minute just pr just praying for, for us and those watching, man? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Father, we love you. God, we love you and we want to love you better. God, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice right now. And I say, Lord, we long to long for you. We want to want you. And Lord, I ask that, that the same grace you gave me the day I was born again, I ask that you would just release that grace uh, for me again, God, release that grace for everyone uh, who, who could hear my voice, Father. I pray that you would just give them uh, uh, such a grace that sin would never satisfy them again. I pray, God, that, that compromise or apathy or indifference would become uh, like ash in their mouth, God, that, uh, that righteousness would taste sweet to us, that peace and joy would taste sweet to us, and that anything else, anything less, would be repulsive to us, Father. I pray that you would transform our appetites and, may, and, and, and hook us, God, on your presence. I pray, Father, that, that from uh, our addiction, from our obsession with you and your presence, would you cause us to be people that, that allow worship and allow praise to you uh, to be our guiding force. I, I pray uh, in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would just uh, transform the culture of the church, to be one of striving, to one of celebrating. Lord, I pray, hallelujah. Lord, I pray that you would transform the culture of the church from one of striving to one of celebrating. Lord, would you teach us to worship? Would you teach us to dance? Would you teach us to sing? Would you teach us to party the way that J Jesus died for us to be able to party? Father, I thank you uh, that, that, that you, in, during this, this quarantine, that you are turning water into wine, that you're turning washing, perpetual washing, into perpetual worship, into perpetual celebration. And so, Lord, I just, um, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice right now, God, that you would grip their heart. Would you captivate them? Would you transform uh, their perspective? Uh, would you cause them to be so fixated on you that no other voice, no other standard, and, and, and no other uh, desire uh, would move them, Father? I just bless you, and I ask you, Father, above all else, would you be exalted in our lives in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. Addy, thank you so much, man. Yes, sir. My pleasure, Brian. Thank you, man. Yeah, man, please give your love to your fam, and, and right, hopefully bro. we'll you see too. you soon when all this changes. You too, man. Love y'all. All right, bro. Love you, man. Take care. Yep. Bye.